Okay, so the question was how do you solve map with fold actually using fold? So map l takes a linked list and a function and returns a new link where every element of the function applied to every element of the original list. You use either fold l or fold r. Uh, and let's figure out what these folds are. So fold r takes a function f, which takes two arguments and a value z. Fold r replaces the link constructor and the empty list with z. It then evaluates this expression and returns the result. Okay, so how would you take a linked list three, two, one, and define a map function, which squares each element? So to construct this thing, we basically want to construct link fn list.first followed by the result of mapping over list.rest the squaring function. Okay. Um, so if we're going to fold r over our original list, what will combine a value from list with the rest? I think that will be a function that takes in that value, squares it, and then builds a link out of it. Yeah, I guess that's the way to think about it. It's like a linked list is one value. It just happens to have not really like joined the elements together in any interesting way, just list them out. So I guess we need to do some recursion here at some point. Hold on now. Oh, oh, do I have this extra thing? That's not supposed to be there. Okay, so that works. So um, life would be easier if we renamed this. So that we could see that this fn is different than this one. Okay. This one is actually this function we've defined. And if you look at what two arguments this gets called on, it gets called on an element of the linked list. And then the result of recursively folding the rest of the list. So this rest has already been squared here and then gets passed in as rest to this function, which just squares the first thing, and the rest has already been squared. I mean, in particular, before rest ever gets passed in to this function, it, this computation has happened. I mean, the return of this expression is what gets passed into rest. And what does this expression do? This folds the whole rest of the list using fun. Which fun? This one. This one which squares everything. So it's right here that the rest of the list gets squared. And then it's here that the first element gets squared. The question is, if you compare, well the question is not if you compare two integers with greater than what happens. The question is if you compare two lists with greater than. Uh, Python doesn't treat this as an error. Instead, there is an ordering across lists as long as the elements within the list are comparable, which numbers are. I believe the rule is that you compare the first element to the first element. Uh, and if one is greater than the other, then the other elements don't matter. So the nine and the eight wouldn't really participate in this computation. Computation. Here, let's switch it. This would just compare the three to the two, see that the three is bigger and return true. Okay. And no matter how much stuff I add here, three eight is always going to be bigger than two something else. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if they both start with three, then it will look at the next element. Okay. So it compares the three and the three, says so they're equal, but that doesn't mean the lists are equal. It then compares the second element to the second element, finds that eight is bigger than seven, calls this true. 
Um, so that's basically the story. Is it goes and compares the first elements and the second elements and the third elements, which l leaves the question: What happens if they have a different number of elements? In that case, uh, longer lists I think are bigger than shorter lists, and this is kind of just an arbitrary decision. Um, but yeah, if you took, if you had two numbers between zero and one and you just like put their digits in a list, you'd kind of get the right behavior. Okay. So if you were wanting to compare like one third is greater than one fourth, well, that's true. And if you wanted to compare that three, 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 three is bigger than two, five, that's kind of the same story. So that, that's like maybe a reasonable way to uh, remember these rules, mm -hmm. but they're kind of arbitrary. I, I, they're there because it is actually nice to have an ordering over values that could potentially be comparable because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it comes up in programming that you just like want to have an ordering over tuples or lists where each element represents something. It's like if you put the year first and the month and then the day, mm -hmm. then you kind of want to be able to compare those triples. Yeah, so the question is like, what about max? I think the rules for greater than are enough to tell you what max does. Mm -hmm. It's true that we left out some rules for greater than, which is what if you have nested lists? So you can't say three is greater than two, I don't think you'll get an error. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you can't say uh, three is greater than two, I hope, mm -hmm. and you'll get the same kind of error. But you could say three is greater than two. And what's going on there is that it's noticing these are both lists, comparing this element to mm -hmm. this element. And then we recursively use the same rule that we had before, which is to mm -hmm. notice that these are both lists and therefore compare this element to this element. So if this were three and this were three, two, well, that one's longer, so it's greater than. But if first we had like some other thing and it was the same on both sides, mm -hmm. then, oh, what have I done wrong? I'm too many of these. Um, I think here's what happened is that it, tried to compare four to four. And the only way it can compare four to four is to compare four to four, which means it had to compare four to four. And then it discovered that this wasn't bigger than that, but it was also equal. And so then it went and compared this to that and decided that uh, therefore this whole nested list is bigger than this whole nested list. Okay. So what about max? Well, if you put all these in a list and call max on it, then it's going to go find an element that's uh, greater than or equal to all other elements. Oops. Get a comma in there. So I believe what max does is it finds the first element that's greater than or equal to all other elements. And we could test this hypothesis as follows. A is a particular list containing four. If I take the max of um, some list containing four and some list containing two and A and some other list containing four, the max should certainly be a list containing four. But which one is it? It should not be A. But if instead I had put A first, then I think it is A. So what max does is gives the first value in the sequence that's greater than or equal to all other values. No, it does have to go through them all to prove that it's the rest. Okay. But it goes through and says, maybe this is the max, compares it to this. If this is the bigger of the two, then it keeps it and compares it to that. And okay. if this is the bigger of the two, then it keeps it and compares it to that. But if, for example, I had some smaller list first, 
it would say, oh, maybe this is the max, but then as soon as it saw this, it would say, oh, A is bigger. And so it would keep that as its candidate. Okay. Okay. So it does kind of a linear scan over the elements of the list, keeping track of the biggest thing it's seen so far. And it only replaces it if it sees something even bigger. Uh, so the question was about this semester's midterm two, question 1B, which was the powers function. Um, if you took the exam, you might have seen it with slightly different names. We gave everybody a different version of the exam, but um, the logic should be the same for this question on everybody's exam, which was that uh, you want to yield all powers of k whose digits appear in order in some uh, positive integer n. And so the idea here was to find all numbers that appear in n, meaning if n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you have 12 and 13 and 14, but also 35 and longer numbers like 2, 3, 4, and 2, 3, 5, et cetera. And then keep all the powers of k. And uh, you'd already implemented is power. So if you get contained n to give you all of the integers that are contained in n, then you can filter for the ones that, um, this looks questionable. This probably wasn't the blank, but we can like fill this in in a second. Um, filter for the ones that are powers of k. So if we really had any kind of blank that we could put in here, then I think what we'd do is we'd take a function that gave me back some candidate, c, which is contained in n, but we don't know whether it's a power of k or not. And then we would call is power. Uh, shoot, I forgot the argument order for is power. But let's just guess. Is c a power of k? And then we call that uncontained n. And that's how a filter would give you only the ones you want. But it turns out that we set you up to have to use curry. And what curry would do is replace this line with the result of taking is power. Oh, is power must have been in the other order. Is power of k c, otherwise curry won't work. Um, this gives you back a function that takes one argument, gives you back another function, and takes the argument. So what's the first argument that you pass in k? And then what are all the other arguments that get passed in? Those are the c's. Okay, so now we can filter out all, keeping only the ones that are powers of k, but we still have to get all of the different integers contained in n. Um, you can do this recursively. You can go through all of the integers contained in n divided by 10. So for an example, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this would give you all the integers contained in 1, 2, 3, 4. So that would include 12 and 13 and 14 and 34 and stuff like that. All of those are also contained in n. So it's the job of contained when taking in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to yield all of the different numbers contained in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which includes as a subset all of the integers contained in 1, 2, 3, 4. So we should yield x. If we're yielding 12, we should also yield 12 with a 5 on the end. That's not going to be included yet. If we yield all the numbers contained in 1, 2, 3, 4, we've left out the fact that each one could be followed by 5. So you could get that by multiplying x by 10 and adding in uh, the last digit of whole. So that's the idea behind how you solve powers, is that you notice there's, um, for every uh, integer contained in this n, there's a version where it ends in five and there's one where it doesn't end in five. And in fact, each number contained in one, two, three, four is contained in one, two, three, four, five. And also there's another one, whatever was contained in here with a five at the end. 
So you yield both of those and you end up yielding all of the different numbers contained in n. And then you can filter for the ones that are powers of k. Uh, so the question is, what is contained n? Contained n is an iterator. Every time you call a generator function, which is some function that has a yield in it, what you get is an iterator over all the things that it yields. So when you call contained on one, two, three, four, five, you get back an iterator over all of the numbers contained in one, two, three, four, five, basically everything that gets yielded. So since this is going to yield everything in one, two, three, four, and everything in one, two, three, four with a five at the end, you get everything with one, two, three, four, five. And the question is, what does filter do and what is its second argument? It's anything iterable. It could be an iterator, it could be a list, could be a dictionary. Filter will take in um, any iterable value, means basically anything that you can get a bunch of values out of and give you back only some of it. Okay, so the question was, how could you create a function, make tree, which takes in a depth and um, branching factor. So that's like how many children each node has. Uh, let's call that B for branching factor. And it builds a tree of integers with that depth and that branching factor at every node. Build a tree of integers of depth D with branching factor B. And what are the integers? Um, well, if you wanted to have depth two and a branching factor of three, then it would just kind of count as it goes. Uh, we didn't say much about whether we'd start at the top or the bottom. Well, let's just put one at the top. Okay, so now we're going to have three different branches. And each of those branches is going to have three different branches. Okay, and then we have a six. And then we have a third branch, which has 10 at the root. And then it's got 11, 12, and 13. That matches up there. We made the whole tree. There's two ways to go about this. Like um, you either track which integers you've used so far, which would probably involve multiple return values or some kind of non-local assignment in order to keep track of where you are, or you could just compute them. Because it turns out there's a closed form expression but it seems like uh, it's more 61A style to just keep track of the numbers you've used so far. So we kind of want to know where we are and we want to be able to build a branch. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking is that uh, we'll pick a label and then we'll move on to the next label and then we'll return a tree that puts that label at the root and then uh, builds a depth minus one tree for every value in the range of B. So we need a base case. And then we'll uh, return the result of building with the original depth. You can see if this actually worked. Oh, it did. Yeah, so basically the way you build a depth two tree is you build a bunch of depth one trees and have those be the branches. And then you build a tree and that's a depth two tree. And there was another question in chat, which is what is this? So this could have been anything, but there's a convention in Python that if you're never going to use that name, then an underscore is a good option so that people don't expect to like look for it. But this could have been I, and that wouldn't have been wrong. 
Okay, so this was the last question of midterm two from this semester, which was called pick. She takes this thing called a number tree and returns a function that is called repeatedly on the elements of a picking order. If that picking order is valid, the final call returns success. Otherwise, if one of the repeated calls is on a number that is not part of the valid picking order, then it says, well, not valid. Okay, um, and the names might have been slightly different in the version of the exam that you did, but uh, I think the logic was the same. So um, uh, this notion of a number tree basically just says there are no repeats in the tree which means that if you start out with a tree, and here's an example, the uh, picking order is one where you're always taking off a leaf and then like pretending that leaf's not there anymore. So you could pick nine and then you could pick eight and then you could pick seven and that's okay. You could pick six next or five or four next uh, but you can't pick three after this. You either have to pick five or six. You always have to pick a leaf. And if you just pick leaves over and over again, then eventually you're going to run out of leaves. So if we just do this example, five goes, then nine goes, then four goes, then seven goes, then three goes, then eight goes. Okay, so we're always picking leaves, then six, and then two, and then one, and then we're out of, we're out of tree. That's the, kind of the story. Okay, so how do you actually implement this? Well, um, there's some function that picks a leaf. Uh, and it says what it does. It returns a copy of maple without leaf k and checks that k is a leaf label, not an interior note. So this is going to do some check. And if that check fails, then it's going to tell you that you did something wrong. Um, otherwise, it's going to build a tree with um, the same root, but picked branches. Uh, okay, so this thing is called maple, and it's got a label, and then it's got some picked branches. Now, what is a picked branches? Picked branches is supposed to be what's left over after you've removed uh, this thing k. So if k is 9, then what you're supposed to get back is a tree that we didn't just remove the leaf. We, the label, we like removed the whole leaf. I'm not going to blank it out, but I hope you get the idea. Um, so I think that's how I would kind of get going, is I know I'm going to pick one leaf because I have a function that tells me that's what it does. Now, why is this useful? Well, um, after I pick this leaf, I need to keep track of the rest of the tree. And I have birch, which is in scope for picker, the thing I'm going to return. And therefore, I need to change birch. And this is also given to me that birch is not local. I think that was in the um, skeleton. So. I think what I want to do is take birch and replace it with the result of picking one of the leaves off of the birch. So I kind of got this far. I mean, it's not really fair because I wrote the question, but uh, if, if you like slowed down and studied what was here, I got this far by realizing that in order to build this function, I basically had to return the same tree with fewer branches occasionally. And then in order to build this function, I needed to keep track of how much tree was left, which means some non-local assignment to perch. It's really the only thing that's available. And uh, I should pick a leaf out every time I call picker in order to have one fewer leaf left so that um, I could eventually pick all the leaves. Okay, so now we gotta discover what it means for something not to be valid pick one leaf is going to call pick one leaf. You can see there's like a recursion in there where it picks a leaf of the branch. And that makes sense. You start with the whole tree. You're trying to pick out the number nine. Well, you've got to pick it out of here and pick it out of here. You know, because it's a picking tree that there's no repeat. So it's either going to remove it from here or here, or it's not going to be there at all. What would happen if it's not there at all? 
um, that would mean I'm picking something that's not a leaf. That's not a lot. So, uh, if maple is not a leaf and maple's label is equal to this thing that I'm picking, like for example, if I have this whole tree and I try to pick an eight, that's not a lot. So it should tell me. But otherwise, I go through all the branches. How do I know whether I should remove a branch? Well, if I go through all the branches of the whole tree, I should not remove either branch. I should keep them both. But if I recurse here into the thing rooted at six, I should keep both branches. And I'll recurse here. And should I keep branches of this? No, I should get rid of that branch if I'm picking K. I mean, picking nine. So I should skip this leaf if. Uh, uh, if k equals b dot label. It sounds about right. I wonder why there's an and right there. There must be some reason. The purpose of skip this leaf is to make sure that when you uh, call pick one leaf on a full tree, what you get back is some tree where you've removed a leaf. And the only way you could ever remove a leaf is if you return fewer branches than you had before. Oh, I guess this only makes sense if B is a leaf. So if B is a leaf and the, it's the leaf you're looking for, then you should skip it. And if you're not going to skip it, then you should append it to the list of things that you're going to keep. I think that's the story. Oh, okay. So skipping a leaf means like excluding it from the tree. Right. Basically what we're doing here is we're building the same tree we had before with one less leaf in it. 